Hello and welcome to this week's, this week's or this month's uh, non-farm payrolls webinar with me, Michael Hewson, and my colleague in Canada, Colin Szynski. Hopefully we won't have any of the technical problems that we had last month. I apologise for that. Um, I wasn't here so I don't really know what the problems were. But um, before we get started, I have to bring up the various uh, risk warnings for compliance purposes. And once we've once we've got past um, once we've got past them, Colin and I can then um, move on and really start to get started uh, with respect to um, what's expected with respect to these numbers, what's particularly important about these numbers, or what parts of the internals of these numbers that we are particularly interested in because I think it's the internals more than anything else that are of interest rather than the rather rather than mm -hmm. rather than the headline numbers. So we're pretty much done there. I can now get rid of that. And we can now start to move on towards what's expected for the actual numbers themselves. Now it's a double report today. It's not only US non farm payrolls, but it's also the Canadian jobs report. And we've just come off the back of a Bank of Canada rate hike um, and obviously a June rate hike by the US Federal Reserve. And I think the big question I think um, that I'm wrestling with, well actually I'm not wrestling with it that much, is whether or not the Fed will do another rate rise this year. And I'm coming to the opinion that I think they're pretty much done in terms of rate hikes. And um, I think the Bank of Canada, it's debatable whether they'll get another one in, but I'll let Colin talk to you about that. But what we sure. are seeing, what we are seeing, I think, Colin, and I think I've, you know you've noticed this as well, is that while U.S. markets continue to make progressively new highs on an almost daily basis, particularly the Dow Jones, the S&P, and the, and, the, and the Nasdaq, European markets appear to have topped out. Um, certainly yes, and in fact, in the, even in the U.S., it's really just the Dow now. The uh, the S and P still stuck, be, still stuck be, between below 2482, and the uh, the Nasdaq uh, hit hit Nasdaq 100 hit 6,000 in the last few days. It's just been hanging around 5,900, even with Apple earnings, even with uh, Tesla earnings, even with with some good numbers out of the big tech stocks. The Nasdaq just hasn't been able to get uh, any farther ahead. And and what this is telling me is the the, the breadth in the market is terrible. We're right now we've we've had this we've got this ongoing rally. It's nearing exhaustion, and the number of stocks keeps shrinking. They were we were talking uh, we'd be talking a month ago about the the five or six Nasdaq stocks that were were driving the market. M more recently, it's been down to one. It's been Boeing basically driving the Dow higher, and a, and, a bit of and, and that's about it. It's it's really uh, getting tired here in the markets. Yeah, I mean we can see the Nasdaq here, um, and the Nasdaq really sort of topped out towards the end of July. And actually, yeah. this is a four-hour chart we're looking at at the moment. So there's a big base around about 58.45, that sort of area. If we take that out to the daily, we can see that once again, look at the shadows on those candles. So we can see there's still plenty of buying interest. Given, judging by the long shadows on this on, on these daily candle charts, but when we look at the weekly, we're still I think we're still really predominantly um, showing that the market is very undecided for these sorts of areas or these sorts of levels, and I think it's going to be very difficult to establish where we go to next. But Colin is right, you know the Dow has been was, has been the one market that continues to push higher, but ultimately if we look at the S and P, the S and P again peaked at the end of July. And really has pretty much gone sideways. Now that's not to say that it can't continue to go higher. But ultimately, what these markets are telling us is that you know there's 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 an awful lot of what I would call caution out there. Okay, this is a five-minute chart. It's probably not very instructive. Yeah, and I ask myself if some of this is starting to become distribution, but it's well, too early to make a definitive statement on that. Yeah, you've also got the weaker dollar, and I think the weaker dollar is also playing into, I think, the resilience of U.S. markets, because yes. ultimately, if you've got a 10% decline in the dollar, since and that's what we've had since the beginning of the year, that is going to translate quite well into... Um, foreign earnings in terms of yeah. you know the the amount of dollars that you can basically bring back into the country. So uh, you know on on a purely exchange rate basis, um, that does act as a significant tailwind 
Whereas on the op opposite side of that, if we look at the dollar index here, and this is over the last two years, we are now starting to approach a very, very key support level, 200 a week moving average. Um, and we're also um, near the lowest level that we've been in uh, for the last two years in terms of the weekly close. So we're at a very, very key point in time for the US dollar. Do I think we can go lower? Yes, I do. I really do think that we can go lower. Can we go lower today? That's the big question. And I'm not entirely convinced about that. That being said, we have broken above the 200 week moving average on euro dollar. So there's an awful lot of conflicting signals out there with respect to technical, um, the technical levels. And I think that's yes. And one more on that, Michael. Yeah. The uh, the dollar index is 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 flashing oversold on the RSI, but it's just kind of bouncing around under thirty. It's not like deeply deeply oversold, but at the same time, it's not that encouraging either. It's not, but also either I mean, way. Yeah, absolutely. But I think there's also other things we need to bear in mind when we look at the dollar index. Let's look at all the other dollar major currencies. So let's look at Aussie. Let's start with Aussie dollar because I think that's actually quite. That's what that could also be quite instructive in terms of where it is with respect to its own 200 week moving average. So we've broken above the 200 week moving average in euro dollar and that's very important because euro dollar makes up around about 58% of the dollar index. So it is a significant driver of the dollar index but it certainly doesn't mean that we're potentially going to go, oh we haven't had confirmation on the dollar index, the euro dollar is going to go higher so we could potentially drift back. This is the Aussie, Aussie dollar on a weekly chart, 200 week moving average. Let's look at the Canada chart, dollar CAD, because I think that could be important in light of the Canadian jobs report. I was looking at that just before we came on air. And this is the daily chart. Let me just bring it up into a weekly chart. Now there's potential here for a potential bullish weekly reversal on the dollar CAD. We can see that, but look also where the 200 day moving average is as well. So we've had one, two, three, four, five successive weekly declines on the dollar CAD. We've had five successive or four successive weekly declines on the dollar index. So this, I think, speaks to first and foremost confidence in the Trump administration, but also, I think, in a fairly weak inflation outlook in terms of what the Fed is going to do going forward. So you know, if I'm looking at dollar CAD here, do I want to be long or do I want to be short dollars? And ultimately, I think even if we get a weak number, it's going to take some doing to get back below this very key support level on the on the on the 200 week moving average, but also this trend line support that I've drawn in from the lows that we saw in 2012. So dollar CAD is approaching a very, very key level here. Is there anything you want to add to that? I uh, know just to note that uh, on the uh, why don't I do with the Canada jobs right now? So we had the rate hike in uh, in July. There's a reason why they raised rates, which is basically the Canadian economy is doing extremely well. The Canadian economy has continued to do well. We'll see if there was any kind of a hiccup in hiring around the uh, around the rate hike. Although flatly, they they did a month, they did a pretty good job in the month preceding to signal to the to the market and to businesses and everybody else that they were going to raise rates, why they were going to raise rates. And, and basically for Canada, what we're looking at is in 2010, they raised rates twice from half a percent to 1%. In 2015, they cut them back, back twice. And now it's looking like they'll probably go back up twice. So we're basically looking and they've done one. They'll probably do another one later in the year. But uh, it's overall, it's a function of the fact that the Canadian economy is doing really well. So the street is taking 10,000, actually 12,000 increase this month down from a uh, 45,000 increase in jobs last month. We had two huge months in a row in uh, May and June, so I wouldn't be surprised to see a bit of a retrenchment in July. However, I also think the street's been overly pessimistic about Canada all year, so I'm looking at 25,000, which is pretty much the middle between those two numbers. That's pretty bullish, mate. Um, in terms of U.S. payrolls, um, you're going 200. The consensus, I believe, is 183. We can see that down here. Yeah. I'm going the other way. I'm going to go 150. And the reason I'm going to go 150 on US payrolls is because of the weak readings in the employment components of the ISM manufacturing that we saw earlier this week, but also um, the um, services as well. The, empl the employment components were a little bit softer than the previous month. Now, the previous month we showed 
you know, fairly decent 222. We may get a downward revision to that. Um, I think it could it could be all about the revision. But also, I think there's been a breakdown in correlations between the ADP report and the non-farms in the past two or three months. If you can see from this spreadsheet here, the yellow column is the ADP numbers. And there's never been more than, say, for example, a 50% 50,000 deviation between the various numbers. Um, but so we've got 268 there. Some of these are revised, 248. And then in March, we saw a big miss on non-farms. We had ADP at 255, non-farms at, at 50. And then we had 148. We had a weak pay, ADP report and a strong non-farms. And then we had strong ADP, weak non-farms. Now, last month, June, there wasn't that much of a deviation between the two. So now we're expecting um, one... 183 in the non-farm number, whereas we got 178 in the ADP. Personally, I think that's too close. There's usually a bigger variance between the two. But as we well know, sometimes these correlations break down, and the correlation between the ADP and the non-farms uh, broke down in March quite significantly. So I don't think we can really draw too much in the way of conclusions as to what to expect today. Yeah. And there's a lot of mixed signals out there. So you, you focused more on the ISM, and I kind of focused more on the the upward revision to ADP and the um, and also the uh, the fact that uh, jobless claims have remained low, still hanging around below 250. So I think this is a report that really could uh, go either way. I could have just as easily, uh, as Michael did, made the case for 150 uh, as I did for uh, for 200. And, and, and something else that's important that uh, Michael and I have been looking at and discussing, and, and Michael alluded to earlier, is what does this mean for the Fed? And, and the answer is this time around, probably not a heck of a lot in terms of the headline number. And, and the reason for this is that it's really unlikely, despite all the chatter we've heard out there, that the Fed's going to actually do anything in September. And and the reason for that is the U.S. hits their fifth fiscal year end on September the 30th. Uh, budget negotiations are underway, but certainly we've seen that there's a lot of contention in Congress. Flatly, they can't agree on anything, and the parties can't even really on the Republican side, they can't even agree among themselves on what they want to do. There, there's tax reform, there's infrastructure spending, there's all kinds of things to argue about. The the Russian investigation is ramped up into a, a grand jury, and there's all kinds of, of chatter and, and noise out there. But also, though, the U.S. is heading towards hitting its debt ceiling again, and there's a possibility that in October you could get a government shutdown. The last time we were staring at a government shutdown in October was in 2013, and at that time, the Fed delayed tapering its QE program from September to December and waited for the whole thing to blow over and I would expect that we'll probably see that again with the Fed uh, the, the, the people that, the, out there that think that the Fed's going to start running down their balance sheet in September I think they're dreaming I think even October is pushing it on the basis that though they that they think they, it could, they, their problems could still be ongoing or they might be just trying to get reorganized coming out of it so I think more likely what you're going to see is the Fed start running down its balance sheet in September and and because of that, Michael and I are in agreement the Fed probably won't raise rates again this year, which is regardless like, of what the, the headline number is. Which is quite unusual for me and you to agree on anything, isn't it, mate? <laughs> um, so the key, the key number I'm looking for this week um, is the wages number. So that is expected to decline from 2.5% um, in June to 2.4%. And if it does do that, then ultimately I think that will be slightly dollar negative. It's certainly, I don't think, going to... Um, prompt an awful lot of dollar buying. But I would say one thing above all, I, say, I think the risk is for a bit of a dollar rebound today, simply because of the fact mm -hmm. that we are at the lows of the week. And it's unlikely that people want to be overly aggressively um, short dollars into the payrolls numbers. There's also on this cable chart a key reversal day on the cable. So that suggests to me that we could get some dollar strength, particularly against the pound. And if we do get it in against the pound, then we're probably likely to see it also against the euro and against the yen, because if we look at the yen, and the yen is a decent proxy for dollar strength and a decent payrolls number. We're at a very big support level on dollar yen, uh, around about 109.80, 109.70. There's, there's a, a conglomeration of support levels all the way through here between 109.40 and 109.50. It is very oversold, so the likelihood is that we could well get a semi-decent number. And I say semi-decent, you know, this is all relative. Um, we could see a dollar rebound 
and dolly yen head back towards around about 110.40, 110.50. I certainly don't yeah. expect to see it much above 110.80. Um, and, 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 and as such, I think the risky side is towards the downside. We may get a moderate sell-off um, in the wake of the numbers, but I would be surprised, I'd be hugely surprised if we break aggressively lower over the course of the next few hours, simply because of how far we've come already. We've come a long way. I think there's an awful lot of what I would call bad news already priced into this week's dollar move. And as such, um, I would be surprised if we if we move much above um, the highs of the day in the dollar. Can I add one more quick thing in, yeah, Michael? quickly, 30 seconds. We're about 30 seconds out. Uh, in addition to all the payrolls data, we're also getting trade numbers and trade numbers out this morning and I am keeping an eye on those because this is the last trade reports for the US and Canada before NAFTA renegotiations start about the 15th of August so I'm going to be keeping an eye on that in the background as well. Oh cool, I, oh yeah, yeah they are there, I, I hadn't noticed that. 10 seconds. Yeah, I know, 10 seconds, so you're going one, I'm going 150, you're going 200, so we'll win out by 200. Two oh nine. Two oh nine and an upward revision. I thought we'd get a downward. That's yeah, interesting. That's interesting yeah. Four point three the unemployment. And Canada ten K, the street was actually right this time. Mm -hmm. uh, eleven K uh, wages stay at two point five. So I'd say that's moderately dollar bullish. And yes. Oh, one more manufacturing payroll sixteen thousand. Street was expecting five thousand. That should make Trump happy. Mm -hmm. And upward revision to manufacturing last month up to twelve k from one k. So the, the, we'll probably see Trump tweeting about that in that in the next hour sometime. Absolutely. <laughs> so all in all, a fairly positive jobs report. The unemployment rate drops to four point three percent. The participation rate's gone up to sixty two point nine percent from sixty two point eight. So again. Um, that's that's fairly positive. More people are coming back to the workforce, and yet the unemployment rate is continuing to fall. Um, jobs growth, um, sorry, wage growth, 2.5, 0.3 month on month. So again, that's slightly positive. There is the stirrings of a little bit of um, wage inflation there. So all in all, a fairly decent report, and I think it's rallying on the back of those wage yep. numbers, probably, and and also the fact that you've got a decent upward revision to the number in um, number in June. So um, we'd expect to see a little bit. Oh, of, and one uh, more. Go on. Uh, trade numbers: 43.6 billion deficit for the U.S. That's a little better than the 44.5 expected. Canada trade deficit: 3.6 billion. That's substantially uh, worse than what the street was expecting. So yeah, dollar positive, and yeah, you can see how short yeah. the market was by that dollar yen chart. Nice, nice, nice little move higher there. So, That's really popped up. So let's have a look at where the resistance level is on that. And I would suggest that it's on the high of Wednesday around about 111. I think if we can break through that, we'll probably head back towards the mid 111s on that. Looking at Euro dollar, a mm -hmm. um, little bit. I think there's certainly potential on Euro dollar now to slip back if we can drill that in to around about 116. Sorry, 116. What am I talking about? Um, around about 117.80 in in the in the short term, and potentially even back to 116.20, which was the initial breakout point. Um, a little bit of profit taking, I would expect to see on the dollar here. A little bit of um, sterling weakness. So I certainly think we can see the pound drift back to the trend line support that I drew on earlier in the session. Particularly given the fact that we've seen this very key, this key reversal day here. Um, and that would suggest that we're probably going to come back to this line here and potentially even as low as 130.40, which was this series of highs through here. We are starting to also turn over on the slow stochastic, which would suggest to me that I think the we've got some scope for a little bit of dollar strength now on the back of on the back of those numbers as we head into the weekend. Let's look at dollar CAD because I think when we were talking about being long of dollars against the CAD, I think that was definitely the right move. And we can certainly see yep. that now based on the daily chart that we've got here. Zoom it right it's down. It's popped about half a cent on the numbers. Yeah. I mean, I think looking at that, um, looking at the resistance level on this particular chart, I would suggest on a short-term basis, if we can get back above 126.20, then that might trigger a little bit of buying. But certainly I think if we, if we, if we then come all the way out, 
Um, I think there's certainly potential now, looking at this weekly chart, for a, for a weekly reversal. And that would suggest to me that there's potential scope for dollar CAD to head back to 128 um, in the longer term on the basis of that um, pattern there, a, bit, a bullish engulfing week, bullish engulfing weeks, or it's not a key reversal because it hasn't made a new low, but it's certainly the body of this particular candle does appear to suggest that we're probably going to go for a little bit of a rebound. So I would suggest that it's probably buying the dips on dollar CAD is the way to go now over the course of the next few weeks in terms of where we go to next given where we are with respect to um, long-term support on this particular chart. Um, let's have a look at um, if you've got any questions about any other indices or um, any other indices or any other markets please please feel free to chip in. Uh, the FTSE 100 looks as if it's going to head higher that's not a surprise weaker pound stronger FTSE it's the seesaw trade, as I call it. Um, so if the pound goes up, the FTSE goes down. Um, if the pound goes down, the FTSE goes up. Um, it's generally tended to work fairly well and would account for the recent resilience of the FTSE, particularly, um, I, particularly when, with respect to the sterling weakness against the euro. So it looks to me as if we're probably going to head back towards around about 75.30 on the FTSE 100. With respect to the DAX, the weaker euro is probably going to play into a slightly, a slightly more positive outlook on the German DAX um, over the course of the next few hours, and we can see that borne out from this particular move here. Once again, it's a currency story with respect to European markets. The sell-off in the, the sell-off in the euro is going to translate into a fairly decent rebound in the DAX. Um, but if the euro t starts to go back towards 120 over the course of the next few weeks expect the upside on the DAX to be fairly limited. In fact, let's draw a trend line in on this particular chart here to give you an indication of where I think the resistance levels are on this particular downward trend that we've got in the DAX at the moment. And you can see it see it there. So I'll be keeping an eye on around about the 12,400. But um, I, would, I would expect, um, I would expect um, 118 to come under pressure in euro dollar over the course of the next couple of days um, always assuming that of course Donald Trump doesn't say anything stupid um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's, that's by no means a given I mean we saw how the dollar sold off last night when um, that Robert Mueller came out and suggested and said that he was going to convene a grand jury so we can we can see that um, you know the dollar is very very much driven by politics at the moment yeah, and it doesn't take much. And the other one to keep an eye on is that Trump has been, um, they've been talking about uh, potentially doing uh, trade sanctions against China, and that's the kind of thing that could really upset stock markets and currencies, so we keep an eye out on that. He was supposed to announce something today, apparently that's been kicked off to who knows when, but that's one of those things that can pop up any time. Just, just, been just asked, keep an eye out on that in the background. Just been asked about when I think the Dow's going to reverse, um, honestly. Don't know. Um, and if you're trying to pick the top on the Dow or thinking about it, don't. Um, because ultimately you're trading against the trend. And looking at this chart here, you know, it's difficult to say where the Dow is going to top out. We could easily go to 23, you know, 22,000, 22,500 very, very quickly. Um, the problem with trying to pick the top on the market is that you can be right in the long term over the say, course of the next five or six months. But in the short term, over five or six weeks, you can get squeezed out quite horribly. So trade what you see. And what I see at the moment is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine up consecutive up days. Don't try and pick the top. Trade with the trend. So at the moment, it's finding support above 22,000. What is above 22,000? You've, you've really got to be long of it until such time as it drops below this series of lows that we've got down here. So... If we look at around about here, you've got a little bit of what I would call congestion or um, sideways consolidation. So essentially what I would do is draw a line, a horizontal line through that, try and drill down to see whether or not there's any short-term support levels through there. And there does appear to be a little bit. But ultimately what we've seen, what we can see from this chart here on the hourly chart, is we've got a whole host of support coming in there. And then we've gone parabolic. 
since we went through 22,000 simply because that um, simply because the market was was basically banking on the fact that 22,000 would cap it. It didn't, and all, all what we've got is a series of stop losses all the way up to 22,100. And this candle here, the hourly candle, suggests that ultimately it's finding decent buyers now around about 22,070. And on a short-term basis, you're going to go poor very, very quickly if you continue to try and pick the top in these sorts of markets. The trend is your friend until it comes to an end. And I know that sounds very cliched, but ultimately it's true. There's been no evidence so far that I can see that this Dow trend higher is showing any signs of reversing. And yeah, the S&P is not following it, and the NASDAQ is not following it, but that doesn't mean that it can't all of a sudden play catch-up. And we can see that here, 2,480, decent top there. But just above that, we've also got resistance at 2,485. It looks like it's a, consolid it's a move up, consolidation, and then a move up again. So I don't know whether there's anything you want to chip in on that particular yeah question. at this point in time it's a it's an interesting one because we find ourselves here at the beginning of August we're, we're staring at what's the uh, historically the weakest time of the year for stocks between August mid-August and, and mid-October there there's all the potential for turmoil in in the US government and the, and the government shutdown which historically has knocked stocks down uh, at some point I, I think we're in a in a definitely a, a long-term long -term bull trend here that started on the US election but at some point we're going to get a correction but timing the correction is really really difficult right now and, and at this point Michael's right it, you have to wait you, you need to see an actual break before uh, before calling the, the the trend change because I've been you know people have been asking me this for for months now it's like look we're in a bull trend until it changes mm -hmm. and and at this point it's not changing but we're certainly all the signs are there everything's flashing yellow but we're not at we're not at red yet as far as trading is concerned and you know this is the best advice I think I can give trade what you see not trade what you think mm -hmm. you want to see you have to trade yeah. what you see in front of you the charts ultimately are the ultimate clues and benchmarks as to what the market is doing it's like this oil price chart here that we've got in front of us here we've seen a decent rebound in prices in the oil price over the course of the past um, couple of days and if we actually look at the if you will look at it on a weekly basis we saw a very strong up move um, last week, and this week we've seen a little bit of a consolidation. But ultimately, what this chart is telling me here is we've got one, two, three um, uh, areas of resistance at $53 and around about $53.50. So until such times as that $53.50 level breaks, then really you need to sell the rally on crude oil. And even if it does break, you've then got trend line resistance coming in all the way across from here. Now, a lot of the reasons why oil has been rebounding is because partly I think we've seen five successive weeks of draws on US inventories, but the dollar's been weak as well. So if the dollar's weak, generally that tends to be fairly broadly supportive of commodity prices. Um, and as such, I think that's why you haven't seen much of a bit of a sell-off in crude oil prices. But we've got OPEC, we've got an OPEC, non-OPEC meeting next week where... Um, the, these members will be discussing non-compliance um, and I think the market has also been uh, pricing that in a little bit with respect to the meeting in Abu Dhabi now I'm not convinced they're going to be able to agree anything uh, any over and above what they already have and if that's the case then ultimately I think the upside in crude oil is likely to be fairly limited and as such will probably drift back down certainly if you look at the way that it's been trading so far since the beginning of this year we saw at the beginning of the year a decent support area around about 53.30. We've sort of oscillated around that. Yes, we are above the 200-day moving average and haven't pushed below it yet, but we did that here and we did that here. And ultimately, the 200-day moving average is all well and good in terms of the overall long-term trend. But in the long-term trend for oil prices at the moment, there isn't one. We're in a sideways trend. So in that context, the 200-day moving average doesn't have as much importance as, say, for example, when we look at that dollar CAD chart, we had the 200-week moving average, and where you had a very long-term uptrend in terms of the dollar CAD, and it's more than likely, or it's less likely that it's going to break through it on the first attempt. 
And I think it's... Uh, can I add something yeah. here on oil, Michael? Yeah. Um, and something else to watch for this afternoon is the Baker Hughes U.S. drill rig count, which comes out at 1 p.m. Eastern time, 6 p.m. in London. And and what's important about this is that uh, the rig count has been climbing, and, and that's to be expected. First of all, during the summer and into the fall and the winter, the rig count generally goes up. That's the seasonal trend, and, and that's the annual trend. That's the way it usually goes. But what's important to note is when the oil and gas oil earnings came out from the U.S. last week, Halliburton, uh, the, the big one of the biggest drillers in the state, said demand is slowing for oil field services. Several of the big U.S. oil companies cut their exploration budgets and their capital budgets. So something's going on there because a lot of the the back and forth we've seen between uh, the U.S. and OPEC has been based on this idea that, well, higher prices are coming and uh, increased U.S. production will sop up whatever OPEC cuts back on. But we're starting to see signs about out of the U.S. that perhaps production may not ramp up, continue to ramp up as much as it has in recent months. So when we see the recount today, it should go today. It should go up, and if it goes up, then that's not going to be a surprise to anybody. It, the surprise would be if the recount happens to drop then that could be a surprise a, a surprise that people would see as bullish for the oil price. That's just one that's out there in the background, but keep an eye on because that could impact oil this afternoon. I'm surprised that because U.S. production has gone up this week. So it has been going up, no question. And I know that's where it's it's, it's really intriguing that the all the oil and gas companies have been getting bearish. Mm, okay. Interesting. Okay, certainly something worth keeping an eye on. So let's have a quick look at gold because we haven't looked at that yet, but I'll, unsurprisingly I would suggest that's probably going to drift lower um, but again with gold I mean this is this has been one of the most boring trades this year um, we've pretty much been trading sideways since April um, decent support around about 1210 decent resistance around 1295 at the moment on the basis of those numbers we're probably going to drift back towards 1250 and um, having failed to get back above 1275 so looking at the oscillator that looks like it's about to roll over as well so that suggests to me that this range is probably going to continue for quite some time to come. And of course, as you suspected, Donald Trump has tweeted, excellent jobs numbers just released, and I've only just begun. There's, I'm sure there's a song. I'm sure there's a song there. Many job stifling regulations continue to fall. Movement back to the USA. Give yourself a pat on the back, Mr. Trump. You're an absolute superstar. So yeah, um, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so, any other questions, ladies and gents, before Colin and I wind this up and um, then we can sort of look ahead a little bit to what's happening next week? No? Okay, well, every Monday we have a weekly webinar at 12.15, which my colleague David Madden um, conducts, 12.15 to 12.45, so we'll be looking ahead to that. You can find out details about that on the education section of the website. Next week, um, the main drivers I think that I will be looking at will be um, US CPI, looking to see whether or not inflation is picking up, Chinese CPI, um, Chinese trade, and um, one of my favourites, um, SNAP's latest numbers, which I think um, will be disappointing. And certainly I think if we look at what SNAP has done over the course of the past few weeks, I think really that sort of just really reinforces what I thought about the company when it first IPO'd, um, that it was um, less crackle and more pop, and that's exactly what it's doing. It's basically now looking to pop lower, well below the IPO price. I think that those numbers are out on the 10th of August, so I can't imagine they're going to be any good. I think Facebook is eating its lunch, and um, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to make any money at all. So looking ahead. At Snap. Facebook is eating everybody's lunch. It's just amazing. Yeah, it is. It's, when you uh, see, even though I just send to like Twitter and stuff. Yeah, it's um, it's a beast. It's a beast. Okay. Um, well, guys, I think we'll wrap this up. Thanks uh, very much for listening. And thanks for joining today. And I hope you all enjoy your upcoming weekends. And until next month, when Colin and I will pick this up once again. Have a great day trading, everyone. Thank you.